of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Matthew. Glory to Christ our Lord. And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. When he came down from the mountain, great crowds followed him, and behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And he stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priests, and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a proof to the people. As he entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home in terrible distress. And he said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion answered him, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I say to one, go, and he goes, to another, come, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard him, he marveled and said to those who followed him, Truly I say to you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. I tell you, many will come from east and west and sit at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness. There men will weep and gnash their teeth. And to the centurion, Jesus said, Go, be it done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed at that very moment. Shuha la la aminai. Good morning, family. Good morning, Father. Let's pray in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Two people are healed in the gospel. First, the leper, and second, the servant of a centurion. The leper goes to Jesus himself, and he rejects the old law that tells him that he has to isolate from the whole community and from Jesus. A leper in the old law was supposed to live in a far distant land away from everybody because leprosy was very contagious. But instead of the leper being contagious to Jesus, Jesus is contagious to the leper. The leper rejects that people judged him as he's a leper because he must have sinned. The leper rejects that he needs to identify with his leprosy. He goes to Jesus. In the old law, a leper would have to go and anytime he saw people, he would have to scream out, unclean, unclean, unclean. But the leper does not identify with that weakness. He cries to Jesus and he says, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. The leper, people said, you know, he's a leper and that's all he is. But I say to all of us, do not let your weakness become your identity. Do not let your situation in life make you who you are. You know, as Chaldeans, we care a lot what people think of us. The more people say something about us, we start identifying with their opinions and with what they say. Do not let that happen. Be who Jesus is calling you to be. He, he looks at the leper and he says, I want to heal you. I love you. You're mine. Jesus sees the truth of a person. The leper is not paralyzed by people's judgments, but he cries out to Jesus. 
So don't let anyone tell you you're not worthy of God's love. Do not let anyone tell you that your past sin is too much for God. Go to Jesus. Cry out to him. Lord, if you want, you can make me clean. One of the greatest places we have for cleansing is confession. Where in confession you are absolved of all your sins and nothing can separate you from God's love and God's mercy. Even an impatient priest or a priest who is not showing the mercy of God. God still has mercy on you. Cry out to Jesus and receive healing. He's always listening. Second, the person, the second person who's healed in the gospel is a servant of a humble centurion. And the gospel says, the centurion says, Lord, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. What struck me as I was reading the gospel was the servant is paralyzed. Not like the leper who's able to get up, he rejects people's opinions and he just goes to Jesus. This servant is lying paralyzed. He can't go to Jesus himself. That means he needs, uh, he needs somebody else to go to Jesus for him. There are people in our community who are paralyzed and can't come to Jesus. Think of this servant who's paralyzed as someone who has no faith. Someone who wouldn't go to Jesus on their own. Family, this community is meant to pray for those who are paralyzed and bring them to Jesus, and Jesus wants to heal them. So let's take 10 seconds right now. Think of someone in your life who doesn't have faith to cry out to Jesus. Someone who is paralyzed, lying on a mat, can't go to Jesus on their own. So th let's think of one person right now. This servant, his healing happened through intercession. The centurion, who has a hundred soldiers under his wing, he's like the good shepherd who goes after the one. He leaves his 99 and prays for the one. So anyone who is a little isolated in our community or you know, doesn't feel the love of God, Let's pray for them to Jesus. Jesus, by your word, you can heal them. So family, pray for our lost sheep. Um, I knew that this mass was going to be packed. Why? Because the evening is going to be empty, right? Okay, we know that we're going to be, a lot of us are going to be watching the Super Bowl. I'll be watching the Super Bowl. And we look at the church and we say, wow, look at us. We're so good as a community. How beautiful our church is full. This is 5%. This is 10% maybe of the community. And we've got 90%. And I'm not saying, oh, the 90% are so unholy. They could be holier than us, but they're not here. We've got to pray for them and bring them to Jesus. Because if they're, if we're like the leper, all of us, we're the leper. We came to Jesus, we came with our sin, and we said, Lord, make me clean, help me. But then there's people paralyzed that are like the servant who can't get up and can't wake up and go to church or whatever it is. And we need to be like the centurion who prays for those people and says, Lord, reveal yourself to them. Because when you say a word, things change. Your word is powerful. But family, in this church, we've got to pray. We've got to pray for those lost sheep. And we're lost too. So we've got to pray. It doesn't say this in the Bible, but maybe, maybe the centurion went up to his servant and he's like, hey, like, I'm going to go to Jesus and I'm going to pray for you. We've tried everything to help you. But you know what? There's one final hope. We're going to go to Jesus and I'm going to pray. I'm going to, I'm going to ask him maybe to come over. Lord, heal my servant. And because of the centurion's faith, not the servant's faith. Whose faith? The centurion's faith, not the servant. The servant was healed. One thing we all love is security. 
We all want to feel secure. You know there's a lot of anxiety in the world, a lot of stress, a lot of insecurity. So we want security. That's why we left Iraq and came to America, because there was more physical security. That's why we don't live in the ghetto, because we want to live in a safer area. We want to live in gated communities, or we want our land. We want security. We also want financial security. We want to have enough money to have security. I'm asking you today, how much money, it's rhetorical, so you don't have to answer, how much money is enough money for financial security? It's actually different for everybody. Isn't it interesting how some people need just a little bit of money for security? Because they just want to live, they want to be simple, because actually they, they want that. A lot of people need more money for security. You guys know the, the saying, more money, more problems, right? More money, more problems. It comes from a rapper who you shouldn't listen to. <laughs> All right, in St. Paul, St. Paul's letter to Timothy today says, those who want to be rich are falling into temptation and into a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires which plunge them into ruin and destruction. Say this with me. For the love of money, the love of money is, the root of all evils. is the root of all evils. Okay, there's nothing wrong with being secure financially. Nothing wrong with that. But what happens when you're rich? If you're rich, you can't be poor again. Because, God forbid, we're poor. If you're poor, you're trying to get rich. If you're rich, you're trying to stay rich. And we completely forget that our security is meant to rest in God. The love of money, where our heart is, we've got to see, we've got to check that. Our security has to be in the words of Jesus. Um, my security, my security, I pray for myself that my security remains in Jesus and in his love for me, in his promise. But I'll never be secure in his love when I'm not living in his love. Family, um, when we sin, we, we feel insecure. Because we, we often, again, we judge ourselves by our leprosy we judge ourselves as, when I sin, that's just who I am. And we're not abiding and resting in God's love. So when we sin, we often doubt that God can love us. And so our security is not in God, it starts becoming in other things. The moment we start hoping in something outside of the will of God, we've placed our security in something other than God. Today, you might, you might gamble and, you know, what's your hope going to be in today? That it's heads or tails or the Gatorade color or whether Philly or KC cover the spread? What is your hope in? St. Paul says, but you, man of God, he's talking to Timothy and I'm talking to all of us, but you, men of God, women of God, avoid this. Instead, pursue righteousness, devotion, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Compete well for the faith and lay hold of eternal life. Today, if you gamble, look, I was talking to the kids yesterday and I was like, I didn't know how to talk about it. But I, was gambling, I was talking about gambling a little. And I was like, kids, is gambling a sin? And they go, yes, because they think, oh, it's so bad. Well, actually, a little bit of like fun gambling is like actually not a sin, technically. But when your heart is controlled by the love of money, then it's a sin. Or when you're gambling so much that it's actually going to hurt you, your family, or your fiscal responsibility to the community, Let's say you're a millionaire. You have millions of dollars. God bless you. You actually have a responsibility to use that money for the good of others. But instead, we can get caught into gambling. 
Or we can get caught into the big houses and pools and whatever. You have a responsibility. Um, this is what St. Paul says. Whoa, this is great. I knew it. Okay. This always happens. <laughs> As for the rich, charge them not to be proud, nor set their hopes on uncertain riches, but on God, who richly furnishes. They are to do good to the rich. They are to be rich in good deeds. They are to be liberal and generous. Thus, when you're liberal and gen generous, laying up for themselves a good foundation for the future. To the rich who waste their money on gambling because it doesn't hurt me. It's hurting somebody. So today, be careful how much you gamble and be careful of how much gambling controls your heart because Jesus wants your heart. All right, I'm going to just end. Our hope is in the Lord Jesus. And whenever we put our security in something other than Jesus, we're not living in Christ. Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 6. Do not store up for yourselves treasures in earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Say this with me. But store up for yourselves, store up for yourselves. Treasures, in heaven, treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy. Where thieves, do not break in, where thieves do not break in. And this is very beautiful right here. For where your treasure is, for where your treasure is there will your heart be.